good evening, everyone, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be talking about something that is very close to my heart and has been. Uh, I've lived in Oman between 85 and 90, and I see also a number of friends here who I know for a very, very long time. Um, it's a great pleasure, and obviously a lot of my work has been on Oman. Um, I lived between 85 and 90, and then after that I continued to do my research, which is where you know, and in fact, my Harat Abdullah in Mana was my doctoral work, but then it has never left me in many ways, although we have done many, many other um, settlements and we have studied other things, but uh, it's, uh, it's very important. And what we will show later on today is precisely that, that how we think um, heritage could become more accessible to a wider group of people, um, to interested, interested stakeholders. So, but I will start with a uh, sort of overview of what uh, uh, we want to talk about. But just to give a kind of sense of what I'm talking about. First of all, I'll uh, briefly talk about the RKM Center and what we do, because that will put things in context. And then uh, I will go into an Omani context, then uh, into Mana and its architecture and social history. Then uh, I will also talk about a, a number of uh, heritage management implementation work that I've been doing, uh, we've been doing, um, just a couple of uh, snippets of that. And then um, Dr. Jamila and uh, Claudia will talk about the virtual exhibition uh, thereafter. So, we are an interdisciplinary research team, which we, we work um, across various disciplines, not only just architecture. We have anthropologists, linguists, archaeologists, um, a range of uh, other uh, sustainability specialists, technical specialists, and so on. So we work on, as has been suggested in the name, uh, we have a team uh, where uh, we have, as I said, various experts, but also in the different countries that we work, we, are, uh, we have very strongly embedded uh, local teams or individuals working with us. Uh, we have been working across a number of countries, as you can see. A lot of our work has been in Oman for obvious reasons, but we have been doing um, digital heritage work in Qatar. Our uh, team, uh, team is also working in Iraq. We have been working in Morocco, but also more recently we are doing um, a World Bank project across the whole of the North African region. Aside from that, we've been working in India, uh, in south of India near uh, Bangalore, in Mysore, and Shrivapatnam, which used to be the, uh, the, um, uh, the capital of the Tiger of Mysore, uh, well known Tipu Sultan, and um, uh, we've been working there as well as on the Gangetic Plain, just north of Kapita. Um, we do a lot of, because many of these vernacular sites are, obviously are not documented at all, so one of the key things that we do is to document those. Now we do the normal terrestrial documentation, measuring things you know, on the ground and everything else, uh, to build these very detailed uh, documentation of sites, but also equally we do um, a lot of ethnographic work, because without uh, the ethnographic work, without understanding how uh, groups of people, tribes, um, and so on work, and like land ownership work and so on, we could not actually piece the things together into a cohesive understanding of how these settlements evolved and so on. So we do, do an extensive amount of work on, in that direction, but also Oman relies heavily on the Falaj systems, which is an ancient system which we have been studying in different ways and there is a, very soon there will be a longish piece published on the Falaj systems, but also their connections with uh, the kind of early medieval um, legal uh, pronouncements in Oman, which is going to be an uh, interesting study. All this comes to um, uh, extensive, we are academics, all of us are academics, and therefore we um, uh, have been producing books and journals, papers and so on, the book on Mana is available there to have a look. Uh, it's on the table. You can please have a look and see you know, what I'm trying to talk about. Obviously, there's a huge amount more there. But also, I'm currently working on a, the project called Cosmopolitan Muscat, which one of my friends here, Sultan, will know has been going on for a long time. But uh, I can promise him that it will be delivered in the next year or so. Uh, <laughs> for, for various reasons. And, 
not least for the, the need for collecting data from different sources, which I would to present as my uh, sort of analogy for this. <laughs> uh, but as we are also um, architects, and we are also, in a way, not only just architects, but urbanists, we are development specialists, I would say. We are keen to ensure that history and heritage is integrated as part of um, the, the future development plans and frameworks. So we have been advising over a period of time over the last 10 years or so the government uh, in Oman, uh, the Ministry of Heritage, what used to be the Ministry of Heritage and Culture, and now uh, it is the Ministry of Heritage and Tourism, about different settlements and how these places can become main, meaningful to future generations. Because without these being meaningful to future generations, I think these sites will actually disappear. And Oman has got a significant number, about over a thousand of these settlements, which uh, needs to be addressed, protected, um, assessed, understood, and analyzed in different ways. So we need to actually work on that uh, very importantly. And the other thing that we do is about digital heritage. We are doing immersive experiences both in Oman and in India, and uh, which Claudia will touch upon uh, and Jamila will touch upon very soon. So in terms of Oman, um, we, uh, I'm sure that most of you know, I do not need to repeat everything, but uh, the Jabal Akhtar and you know, his highest speak being Jabal Shams actually begin, uh, creates this sort of major spine across Oman and then divides the northern part of Oman into two key areas. One is a kind of coastal strip, which is a narrow strip, and then farther on, we go to the hills, go up to the hills, and I will present one of the uh, the implementation projects up in the hills in a place called Misfatullah Green, which will be um, sure, which will be a really um, interesting project to look at. But my focus will be farther down this way, where some of the largest uh, oasis settlements exist. Now, um, Oman has had a, a very ancient beginning. You know, it's recorded in various uh, cuneiform texts. Um, we have references to Magan, which is. Uh, as we understand today, as an early stance, is the closest to what we can think about as uh, being Oman in, in territorial sense. So it has been referred to in very ancient texts, but also there is a very likely uh, mention in the Asurbani uh, text um, about uh, Iski, uh, where a particular king, uh, from Kade, used to have brought uh, tributes to um, uh, to Mesopotamia. So, therefore, there are kind of various links to the ancient world. But also, these links brought back a lot of uh, influences back into Oman. So, for example, that when you look at um, the Sibon routes, uh, they connect uh, extensively connect uh, you know the Eastern Asian region, China, and so on. India, of course, and East Africa uh, into Oman. But also the land routes actually brought people in, and I'll refer to those things as I, I talk about the kind of the population movements. Uh, but these are the kind of uh, key movement patterns that have shaped Oman. So Oman is both essentially Oman is an Indian Ocean uh, culture rather than just an Arabian culture uh, in in essence. So. These kind of migrations, as you can see in this particular, on the left hand side, is key. It's reputedly one of the oldest settlements in Oman. Uh, the two, uh, two settlements, uh, Yemen and Nizar, are actually make reference to those two migratory routes, which uh, coincided eventually into, uh, it, uh, brought, came together in, in Oman. And those, eventually, those two groups of people uh, representing certain tribal groups had actually coalesced into either one settlement or the other, and hence the name of Yemen, those who came from along the coast from Yemen uh, after the fall of the Marib uh, Dam and uh, ended up in Oman, but also the ones who took a longer route through Central Arabia and back into Oman, which are the Nizaris. So, that's one part of the kind of land-borne uh, connections that Oman brings together. But also, on the other hand, as I was mentioning, the long trade routes established between China, India, East Africa, and Oman resulted in 
these uh, examples of Chinese porcelain being uh, have, uh, having ended up in you know, central Oman, quite deep into the country, um, and not at the coast in the coast at all. Uh, so uh, there are, and that I will talk about very briefly. So when we look into Mana uh, and its architecture, Mana is um, is in central Oman. I will show you in a moment, but. Uh, it has been um, one of the earliest settlements in, uh, of the region, and it's very likely to have been a pre-Islamic settlement. Uh, there are many reasons why that is being uh, thought to be the case. Uh, the eponymous um, Omani, the Malik bin Faham, again, uh, one of, of the Yemeni origin, the ones who traverse the coast of uh, the southern Arabian Peninsula into Oman, uh, they, uh, Malik bin Farm was rep has rep was, did repeatedly dig a palage here, and that the evidence local people will show you the evidence of that. But nevertheless, the issue is that these palage systems are ancient palage systems. They date back to 1000 BC, in certainly in the Shirkia, the eastern region, and many of these are certainly from about 600 BC. So there is a strong tradition of. Uh, the Falad systems, which uh, underlie all of these settlements, uh, is being a seat of Islam and Islamic learning for from very ancient times, from the very early days of in, uh, Islam, in fact. And uh, it was one of the key towns. If you look into the 16th century, it was uh, mentioned by the Portuguese chroniclers as one of the three key settlements in central Oman. The others being Bahla and Nizwa. Uh, they were also. As I will show you, the mana was in the center of the revival of um, uh, the decorative tradition in uh, prayer niches, the mihrab, and that happens in the 16th, very early 16th century onwards. Uh, the, it also produced an imam at the least, I think, uh, in around 1560, and many, many uh, scholars, of course. Um, and it was uh, certainly being where it was. It was the location of the exchange for you know, nomadic and settled um, tribes uh, over a very long time. Now, in 1835, uh, Lieutenant uh, J.R. Wellstead of the Indian Navy, who was the first non-Oman, non-Arab to have visited, and possibly non-Omani Arab to have visited uh, 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 Manam in 1835 in December, post 23rd of December, uh, he exclaimed, you know, in ecstasy that, you know, so as he approached Mana, he was talking about as we cross these with lofty almond, citron, and orange trees, there is a bit of, you know, uh, ex you know they are not entirely correct, but nevertheless, I think the, the sense you can get that, you know, it was yielding a delicious fragrance on either hand, exclamations of astonishment and admiration burst upon us. Is this Arabia, we said. This is the country we have looked on heretofore as a desert. So the kind of, the extreme verdure, the greenness, and the kind of expansive oasis that he was experiencing was something that struck him as extraordinary. And it is true that Mana, the word means the, a gift from God. And you know, it is truly uh, one of those kind of uh, uh, extraordinary uh, oasis settlements that one would find. Clearly that, as I was mentioning, the Falad system is uh, behind all of those things and we normally have three types of Falad systems in Oman. One is called the Daoudi Falad system after uh, Suleiman bin Daoud, uh, so, uh, the, which is a deep aquifer fed one which I show on the left hand side. The Aini Falad, which is a spring fed Falad system, which uh, the one in Bosher, the two, you know, these are these are the kind of the wells the, that bring out the spoils, and they are heaped around. So they're heaped around in a way to create a bank so that it prevents the debris from falling back in. So therefore, these shafts are kept open. So it's for ventilation, but also for uh, maintenance and everything else. So that's how the the oil fallout system is. Created, of course, the first one is to tap into the mother well. That's called the mother well, and then a horizontal-ish gallery with a slight inclination is created, uh, which ends up in, in the villages where it surfaces. But 
there is a gallery, underground gallery, that runs for uh, sometimes several kilometers. Uh, a very good example of that is a very late uh, creation in Bosher by the Albusaids as they settle down. There is that used to be a beautiful building called Fath al Busaid um, in the area where the Al Busaid settled down. Unfortunately, it's in a very bad state, but it's it's one of those beautiful pieces, those gems of architecture that could, and I believe still can be preserved or rebuilt uh, in certain ways because there is plenty of example uh, evidence that exists. But if you look into that on the plan, you know that the sources of the Falaj exist at the base of this hill and hills farther down, and these underground channels then uh, run through towards what is here the, the fort, and then beyond that is the agricultural land. So that is here, the fort being there, and the, you can see the streak of greenery here, and that actually marks the, the, the root of the Falaj below the ground. And uh, this is a 18th century, mid to late 18th century enterprise, uh, that kind of creates this almost a miniature of a oasis, but that exactly is what happens with more of these more well-established oases in Lake Fatsbe. Semana is um, farther down from the hills, just on the sort of desert foreland, uh, where the ground is reasonably flat, but also, uh, as you can see here, Mana is over there with the hills breaking down, uh, the large um, uh, wadi systems, the dry river systems, uh, begin to converge as well uh, beyond Mana. Uh, as you see here, that this is almost a kind of island in the middle of these large water systems, the Wadi Halfain and the Wadi Moedin, uh, they, they come together, um, and uh, uh, that's where Mana Oasis is, is located. Now, the agricultural land is right in the middle with uh, the different uh, settlements, these four settlements, Fekain in the north, right at the top end, then Harat al Bilad, which is in the middle, which is this, what I'm talking, going to talk about in a little more detail, then Mara, and then Mahmud on the western side. So these settlements are located in such a way so that they are not wasting any of the agricultural land, and they are really densely packed settlements uh, which uh, maximize arable land uh, use. Uh, today, it's no longer what Wellstead was talking about, and uh, it's the, much of the oasis is drying up for all sorts of reasons, partly because uh, there is a periodic sort of uh, drop in water table and then rise back again. And this happens throughout history, that's one thing. And the other thing is that we are dra drawing too much water, underground water, uh, for everyday use. Uh, the new settlements are using up a huge amount of water. And, you know, it's interestingly, Mana is one of those settlements where there were plenty of wells within the settlement itself. And there were probably about, I think if nothing else, about 25 to 30 <coughs> wells that you can locate within, the, within this particular small settlement itself. So you can see that the water table was accessible and they were using it, but current usage has completely gone um, beyond any recognition. Um, the settlement uh, is a walled settlement, entirely walled settlement, with a uh, 18th century, uh, possibly a 19th century uh, extension beyond the western wall. Uh, but you can see that there is a the original souk was at the northern end. Then there was the settlement, the walled settlement. Uh, we have the fort here, and then the Friday mosque is down there. Um, in this plan, you will see that that. The, the main entrance is on the north with a square tower next to it. There is a round tower just on the southern end, and then another <coughs> western gate and an eastern gate. So these routes actually converge on the main uh, north-south spine, and then there are these several um, uh, settlement, uh, the internal uh, routes and passages and so on. Uh, a major part of this is very densely packed, as you would see here. But the southern part, as you go towards this, the land, the flocks are much larger, and therefore that suggests less changes that having taken place over a period of time. So it would have been agricultural land, and I'm coming back to that one in a moment. So at the northern entrance, you have this tower, this square tower, which is called the Burgal Jus, 
um, it is because of the the juice or the gypsum, uh, not gypsum, but serruge rendered um, uh, finish that you have. Um, Wells did when he looked, probably he looked at it as he camped, he looked at it from a distance and he thought that they were all round towers or square towers, he wasn't sure, but he ne nevertheless put those as the same, but if you look at it, the, the northern one was a square tower, the, round, the southern one is a round tower in plan, um, uh, and they are very distinctive in their character. Um, streets, some are very wide, um, as you can see on the left hand side, which are the main streets, which um, are say about three, three and a half meters in different locations. Uh, but then there are very narrow passages and alleyways which eventually lead to these different uh, houses and uh, dwellings. Now, gateways are also connected with one of the important things about Omani settlements is that we have um, uh, the communal meeting halls which are called sabla. Now, uh, they are not majlis, which is uh, often used word in Arabic about uh, the gathering halls. Uh, they are um, communal and tribal. They are specific to particular tribes uh, or their um, client bodies. And uh, they had operated uh, also in multiple ways. Uh, one being that uh, they would also provide, as in this case, they would provide um, uh, security measures because if you look into this, the supply is on the upper floor, which is this particular narrow long room. It allows a kind of uh, a linear uh, congregation to take place, but also this return out actually provides an opportunity to look down this street, which is, so on this side is the, the 19th century extension that I was talking about on the western wall. So it is possible to actually look down along the wall and provide surveillance. Uh, but also, usually you'll have uh, these sublers in the case of uh, visiting tribal groups and so on, they might be actually um, uh, resting and uh, halting for the night over there. So it's a kind of uh, place where you would have uh, uh, different uh, visitors um, being received. Uh, at the same time, you will have uh, also during uh, times of strife, the groups will go get together and uh, decide on the course of action. Uh, now. I will just have a quick look into, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll go to this one and then I'll come back to the other ones. Um, dwellings are of different sizes. You know, you've got large dwellings and there are smaller dwellings. Obviously, when you see large dwellings which are organized like this, you'd see that they've been probably a result of reorganization of the land uh, by purchasing a number of parcels of land and then pulling it together. And uh, so, that is uh, one, uh, this is one of the houses belonging to the Worthy tribe, uh, the Wurud. And uh, this, this is quite a complex house with an upper floor uh, where inevitably in most of the Mana houses, you'll have the kitchen, the toilet, pit latrine, and uh, other kind of grain storage and so on will actually be on the upper floor. The lower floor will be mostly for other kind of storage and cattle um, pens. Uh, so that's a kind of general organization, but this one also contained a small shop which uh, was given access from this kind of forward uh, passageway. Now, tribal movement um, has obviously taken place across Oman all the time, and I've mentioned the, the situation in Iski, which uh, these things have also created new settlements, or also broken down settlements at different points. Uh, if you look into certain settlements like this, how am I doing for time? Oh, you've got about 12 minutes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 6.20, is That's it? Okay. Oh, brilliant. So, um, I've got time. 6.28. Uh, 6 28, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll shoot you. Uh, so, you can see that these are, these large uh, Oasis settlements have, um, cosmopolitan, if you like, a cosmopolitan um, sort of uh, makeup because different tribes from different groups have actually come together and they often do not follow the, the traditional Nizari Yemeni divides or any other kind of political divide in these kind of central, if you like, capital uh, settlements, you know, within large oases, there is that sort of breakdown of those 
traditional divides where people will be living next to each other with different, otherwise who could have a different um, view towards uh, their political alliance and allegiances. Now, in this case, what I wanted to show you that the um, the um, the Al Basayti tribe, when it became, uh, it started to uh, gain uh, political power and moved uh, from north from Adam to towards Mana and then through into Nizwa, Barkat al Mawz, and so on into Bolshir eventually. What they did, and this is a kind of uh, thing that you know happens all the time, is that they carry with them their traditional alliances. So, for example, in in uh, Mana, when they settle in Mana, and this is where I was saying that there's note that these are very very densely packed set, you know plots, and these are where set maybe dwellings have existed for a long time and they've undergone changes within itself. Whereas if you look into the lower end of it, where I've got the large circle. Uh, plots are larger. Now that, uh, and also there are uh, evidence of agricultural wells within it. So it's very much possible that in the 18th century as they were moving, they settled into agricultural land. Now, the reason why that happened is because there was no other area to develop, but what they did is that they also uh, came with the allied tribe of the Mandaris. The Mandaris uh, settled within agricultural land too. But what happened is that originally the land, the, the site was probably up to here or maybe even here. And then as these Mandaris settled down, you can see the kink in the root as well, where they then allowed the settlement to be extended. So this is a complex negotiation that allowed maybe the settlement to be extended, land re reorganization because Already agricultural land has been used up here, so new agricultural uh, property was created, a new well was created, so that agriculture within the settlement could also continue. So this is one thing that, uh, so the Mandaris were here, but then when they go to Bosher, you know, up in the, in the coastal area, what we see also is that where they bring their, um, the Falaj digging Awame tribe, who are associated with them from the area of Adam, they bring them to dig the new phalanges that I was talking about in the case of the Bosher example. So mosques, again, in central Oman are very unique because they do not follow the sort of traditional form of, you know, open Liwan type where you have the arcade, you enter frontally and so on, and uh, you have a minaret. You don't have any of those things. Now, one can say that, yes, it's an economic thing, but no, it isn't. There are a number of underlying reasons for it. So there is the cell type, a box, closed box type, one set uh, mosque. And in many, many cases, they're actually accessed not frontally, but frontally as well as from uh, laterally. So that you enter and you then turn uh, at an angle to face the mirror. And uh, the other thing that you have to look at is the Buma, which is this miniature um, sort of uh, domical structure which sits on top um, and it has got, the word has got a pre, uh, non-Arabic origin if I can say that, you know, but nevertheless Semitic origin of the word. Uh, the, the closed cell uh, type mosque is not found in Central Arabia, Saudi Arabia for example, or in Bahrain, or in the example on the right hand side top is a Bahrain one, which is open, whereas the ones that you find from Yemen, uh, from pre-Islamic times to into Islamic times, and then if you look into uh, the along the coast, you'll find that the example of the this closed box type mosque is very prevalent. So there is a strong reason that to believe that you know it came along the coast or was there, you know, as a specific type along the South Arabian coast. The Buma again is, um, as I said, was not the word does not uh, it can connote a number of things. It's also an owl, which is, um, uh, could be seen to be a silhouetted body, which takes that kind of form. But also the Buma is a uh, inflection of the word Bama uh, in Hebrew. So there is a kind of connection with a high sacred place. So there are a number of um, ideas that come together. But also, interestingly, these kind of pre-Islamic tombs, which are often located across the, you know, the hill ridges in Oman, are also called Buma or Bama, 
uh, Boma. So the third thing that I would talk about is that the, the prayer niches. Now, the first decorated prayer niche we see in uh, Oman is from 1252 AD uh, in Nizwa, in Sal. And then after that, there is a hiatus. And in 1503 onwards, then suddenly we find in Manam uh, the re-emergence of these uh, decorated mehra. And they happen, uh, we think that, you know, there is a reason to understand that this was done because of uh, reorganization of wealth, confiscation of wealth uh, from the Navahinas, and then redistribution of that wealth. But what is interesting is that also we have the, the various kind of decorated motifs, especially the kind of endless knot motifs that are found. But the porcelain, the Chinese porcelain, uh, bold inserts that uh, uh, align well with this idea of some developing mystical ideas about, you know, the kind of uh, the issue of illumination, um, the moment that, you know, in, in, in Islam, that is quite cru crucial. And we did some chemical analysis, and one of the things that was very clear from it, and we did it across central Omani settlements, that they all point, although these are 17th century um, spolia, but they all point to three different locations in China from where they came, you know. And so there are the kind of standard places, Jingazen and Zhangju and uh, Dehua, uh, they're all standard places where commercially porcelain was uh, uh, manufactured to for um, export uh, around the world. Okay, and uh, but these this particular traditions finished off in the 19th century, in around 1830 or so, uh, when the Wahhabi influences came through. They within a very short time they actually uh, call, uh, took over a number of settlements. You know, and as you can see uh, on the red route down here that. Ibri, Senao, and uh, up to Belad Bani Bulali, they were all um, influenced by the Wahhabi movement. And as a result of that, if you look into Ibri in Salaif, you know that the mosque that in Oman, central Oman, the Ibadi mosque never have a projecting uh, made up, suddenly you find that you know that's being reconfigured to create a um, uh, uh, sort of Wahhabi Sunni uh, looking kind of projected made up. And a minbar, which is a very unusual thing in, in central Oman. And also, many of these decorated mehrabs were eventually um, carved over, rendered, so that they lose the decorative uh, content uh, very quickly. And also, as you can see, that there are um, evidence of some damage done to those postman bowl as well. Now, looking at very quickly a uh, few things, uh, where are we now? <laughs> 30? <laughs> I'm doing well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've talked about the historical aspects, and I think that it is very important for me to emphasize that I think when we talk about urban planning, design, you know, the future, how we shape the future, and so on, I think one of the things that is often missing is a kind of a deeper understanding of the past. And the ability to translate that creatively into the future. That needs a lot of knowledge. That also needs the equally the kind of uh, lateral thinking that architects and planners uh, so on should be having. Now, that I think is very important. And I think that knowledge often is not there. I might, you know, I dare say that, you know, amongst many consultants who work there in those parts of the world, there is an approach taken often which is a very generic one. Therefore, it destroys some of the kind of the, the critical values and significances of many of these structures. So uh, it would be really good. My call is that you know, we, uh, you know, first of all, become more knowledgeable about it, but also employ the knowledge in a creative way on it, in it. So two examples I'll talk about. One is a house which we did while we were doing a number of those heritage management plans. Uh, this is in Salala, where we found a merchant house uh, in this state, as you can see, the northern end has pretty much collapsed and it kind of has disappeared. So, and the southern, the main facade had existed. Um, and, but we had to, uh, then we had gone through a number of iterations to look into how might we reconstruct that back wall. Originally, the intention was not to do that, but the client was very keen that we did that. 
So we were then playing with this idea that you know it should not look like a wall that is standing on the ground, as it were, because it is not the real wall. Therefore, we had to find a sort of t technique of almost making the wall appear as if it's ho floating above ground, and therefore it is not the authentic wall that you know one would have. Uh, so we created a number of devices behind it to make you know that work, and you know that's the kind of the wall in the northern end, which is uh, which has been reinstated, but with also outside space and so on. So you can see that in the back end, and we did quite a complex arrangement here to make this wall. And it, as you can see, that we opened up the back, you know, to create this sort of sitting areas and so on. The whole this private house was the intention was to turn it into a cultural center uh, for uh, use and at least partial access to the community. Uh, internally, we also did a number of changes to it, but without actually losing the typology of the house, and which was. Completed to an extent, we were not entirely happy with that. We must say, but uh, I think uh, there are a number of issues. But some of those were done, you know, reasonably nicely. The other one that I want to talk about is Miswatala Breen, where um, you know, near Alhambra, up in the hills, a beautiful little t village where um, the settlement is uh, on the on the incline, but with uh, obviously the agricultural land of Oasis around it, with an ancient Oasis system, uh, Fala system, and this particular tower here is relatively, um, was constructed by the Sassan, during the Sassanid time. So, uh, Rogan, uh, Kalat Rogan is its name, named after, uh, apparently, um, uh, uh, you know, a general of the uh, Sassanian uh, army. So, like many other settlements, you know, we had to uh, painstakingly uh, document that and draw it up because no documentation exists and I think this is a kind of crucial thing for us because we think that um, a lot of these um, settlements are not being appropriately documented and documentation being the first thing that one would do um, to preserve a settlement even if the settlement later on disappears. Um, we worked very closely with the community. Uh, we were brought in with the, by the ministry and told that you should be a bridge between us and the community because they were not speaking to each other and uh, we needed to be that. But also very quickly we found out that there could be an opportunity to develop a um, uh, cooperative which we worked on and from a uh, membership of five it grew then by the time we were doing the implementation to about 50 we did a significant amount of stakeholder engagement but also did very painstaking assessment of the tourism economics, how it would work and what kind of investment should go in. And typically one of the things they have learned that, you know, before about it is a long-term investment, you know, and the returns cannot come within the first five, six, seven years. It is, a, you know, by about sort of eight or ten years, then you start to see some benefits out of it. And unless the government is prepared to do that, unless investors are prepared to do, do that, it's not going to work. But also, we looked into extensive strategies for uh, sustainable development, energy generation, and so on. Now, uh, we brought in our historical ethnographic understanding to structure the settlements and to organize its uh, uh, hierarchies, uh, pathway hierarchies, and so on. Uh, we did extensive work on uh, developing the different parts of it and how they will work for different purposes job creation, not only just tourism, job creation, training, capacity building, um, a range of other facilities that will come into it. Uh, clearly the visit of um, King Charles, the then Prince of Wales, and uh, Jeremy is here, and you know, he knows well, um, that we uh, managed to uh, bring him to uh, Mitzvah de Labrine and take him around. And I think that was a very important uh, uh, influence uh, in the later decision to fund some of that, which was done by the Bank Muscat, who we worked very closely over a year or so to find a strategy to do a phase one implementation, which we did, and looking into vulnerable structures, but also what was necessary for that place. We worked very closely with the kids there to develop ideas and so on, where um, you know, many of these ideas were very interesting, some we already knew, but some also that came as a surprise, and we actually introduced and integrated those into our work. 
which resulted in a number of structures inter being intervened with. So one being the main entrance where we found it like so. And you know, the internally, uh, the next door house, which we argued should be a kind of information center and a kind of gallery, possibly a sort of a core uh, place where information could be held. And that was found, as you can see in this image at the bottom. And uh, we developed that uh, working very closely, uh, but entirely, uh, almost entirely done uh, uh, at Liverpool with our RPM team, where we developed that with insertions. You know, again, I think that adaptive reuse, modern, modern interventions are crucial to make sense of the old, you know, because one stands as a context for the other to uh, operate. And we did this work where there was a lot of um, restoration type work, but also insertion of these fairly delicate elements you know, within that. Again, the other one was a culinary training center, which we uh, found in this way. The site in front was very important because this was only periodically used for um, the, uh, what do you call the shua, the, the, during the Eid festivities. And we wanted to maintain that, but also wanted, there was a wheat grinding place, Raha, what they call it, just behind in that building. So in order to do that building, uh, we looked into that front space, the Harata Shua, but also that building A11 in, on, on the top end, sorry, A10 on the top end. And we kind of developed all of that into the sort of, again, very careful removal of material, but also internal insertions into it. And finally, this one, which is uh, uh, the cafe restaurant, which again, we found in a really you know, dilapidated state from where we started building, which was a slightly different in that kind of spectrum from conservation, rebuilding to new building. We found that this was uh, an amenable to that kind of new building where we did a lot of work on it. Now, once so this one had more of an, a modern element to it, but also incorporating some of the uh, ideas that the, the children and others were giving us. Uh, they were done very carefully following typological understandings, understandings of what staircases did and what it brought into those spaces. Uh, I'm not going into great detail, but also environmentally, we wanted to keep it as passively ventilated and uh, aerated and lit as possible. Hence, you know, some of these sections that you can see where we tried to use uh, passive ventilation to sort of create the ambience. And uh, also, uh, we inserted, you know, and we took care of because it's a, when it rains, it rains quite heavily in, in areas like Misbah. So we kind of took care of that too. And all this work actually did pay off reasonably well. I would say that I think eventually um, we managed working with the local community and the government, we managed to put that to the United Nations World Tourism Organization. And they got the award of the best tourism village, you know, amidst, uh, I mean, obviously they were not the only one, but uh, they were uh, one of a number of those. And uh, that was at least something that put Oman, these villages and these settlements into, uh, into a world framework, if you like. And that's what we can say, say is that a little bit that we you know, have contributed to. Um, so, uh, you know, after this, uh, Jamila and Claudia will talk about the, uh, the virtual exhibition. So I hope this was helpful, interesting. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, very quickly, I would like to give uh, you a bit of a background um, of uh, the Harat al Bilad Mana virtual exhibition uh, project. So, basically, explain to you how it came about and how we uh, got to where we are at the moment. So, in 2019, we did some field documentation in uh, Harat al Bilad and we started. Uh, drawing on the material um, collected uh, on site to develop heritage interpretation material with the idea, the intention of uh, holding at some point a physical exhibition uh, in Mana. But unfortunately that didn't happen because then, as we all know, in March the COVID-19 uh, pandemic hit. So the settlement was also closed uh, uh, to the public and uh, um, 
up until that point, it had been uh, open to visitors uh, for around so a couple of years. Uh, it was uh, it was operational. So in 2021, 20, uh, this uh, report was published by the International Council of uh, Museum. They looked at um, basically the impact of lockdowns, COVID-19 lockdowns on the cultural sector primarily. And the findings of the report highlighted that obviously there had been a massive uh, uh, reduce in income for the sector and uh, a reduction in operational capacity. A lot of jobs, as we all know, were lost, and generally a lot of cultural programs and opportunities had to be uh, stopped. So overall, there was a huge impact on society, large, of course, worldwide, and these uh, uh, translated into actual impact on the community's well-being. So looking at uh, these findings, we thought, we were sort of asking ourselves, how can we uh, draw on the material that we had developed with the idea of holding a physical traditional exhibition, A, not to lose it, and B, to be of some help uh, to the Amani people. And we came up uh, with the idea of uh, turning that uh, physical uh, exhibition plan into a virtual exhibition one, with the aim, um, firstly, to deliver uh, um, what we wanted to be uh, user-friendly, open access, and a research-informed uh, digital resource that everyone could use, both in Oman and, of course, worldwide uh, um, to get a better, more informed uh, and enhanced uh, remote experience, so both on-site and off-site of these uh, beautiful settlements heritage. And then at the same time, we wanted to create awareness of the importance, the urban architectural and artistic importance of this settlement in the history of uh, Oman, in particular of um, uh, the region, the interior region. So, um, how the journey developed? So, we first uh, approached the university and we submitted a funding uh, uh, proposal. We got, uh, towards the end of 2020, very small funding, but uh, uh, we made the most of it. And uh, in-house, Claudia, myself, Shaman, and uh, the Liverpool School of Architecture's IT specialist, Martin Winchester, just developed uh, uh, this virtual exhibition which is essentially a website like Claudia um, will soon demonstrate, and it comprises the actual 3D virtual experience, an intro film, which you see at the bottom right, uh, um, produced by Monica Kirk, who is also um, an architect, apart from being a filmmaker, a successful filmmaker, and she's been working with us for a while. And then a series of research posts in which, uh, through drawings and photographs, we tell the story of uh, uh, this settlement, but we particularly focus on the sites that you see in the um, top right uh, uh, picture. In June, towards the end of June this year, we soft uh, launched it essentially through social media communication and by circulating it to uh, colleagues uh, um, and friends. And uh, what we hope to achieve in terms of uh, impact is uh, obviously impact uh, on the society at large and hopefully on the culture and tourism sector um, as well. So informing the general public, but we are also looking at these digital resources, something that could uh, inform government officials, um, cultural, cultural sector staff, for example, museum staff, museum uh, um, sort of uh, um, guides and tour guides and uh, to enhance the on-site visitor um, experience so we imagine that visitors going to physically uh, tour around the settlement would be able on their mobile phones to basically access the additional resources that we are providing here uh, virtually and then obviously we hope that it will also produce impact within uh, uh, academia, so enhance and augment existing knowledge uh, of Oman's heritage uh, uh, environments through dissemination that uh, uh, makes use of different media, as you can see. So I will leave it to Claudia to demonstrate the navigation. Yes. yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just going to show you um, how the website is structured and also how to access and navigate uh, the virtual exhibition so that uh, if we have time and if you like, uh, you could taste it um, here after the Q&A session. 
So I might need to, or Jamila, can you come and help with maybe because I need to uh, use the, or if you can hear me, I don't need to. Yeah, if you can hear you, yeah. So the website is basically um, split in three main sections. Uh, the first one, as Jumina was mentioning, uh, has an introductory te uh, text and uh, video where um, there are information about uh, the settlement itself, uh, but also uh, the project. Then there is a settlement model where uh, key heritage sites are highlighted and uh, we approve them uh, based on the type of um, building. So there are the four gates and then uh, mosques within the settlement, as well as some of the dwellings and uh, sadlers. Basically, if you click on each of those highlighted settlements, you'll be um, directed to a dedicated uh, research informed post. So you'll find a photograph and then a text with information about uh, um, features of the building and also um, the special layout and special quality of, of each building. At the bottom, uh, as you can see, there are um, other photographs or drawings. You can click on those and get captions and then um, information about um, a photo or credit. So in this case, uh, most of the photos are from Clive Gracie, who is a photographer living in Oman for many years that over uh, the years um, has documented, photographically documented many um, vernacular uh, settlements in Oman. One of these is Harat al Bilad, and for this project, he actually uh, gave us some of the material even for the project in 2019, where we were supposed to have a, a living exhibition, but then he sort of uh, donated other photos for the, this uh, digital exhibition. So most of the photographs are uh, from Claire Grace and from here you can access to uh, his website. But then uh, all the drawings are instead uh, from uh, Shomen's uh, research. And basically by clicking on here, you'll be redirected to a catalog that gives uh, more information about uh, the settlement and other structures as well. Then you can go back to the home page by clicking on here. And at the top here, there are these tabs where you can find a glossary where all the terms, like specific terms that are listed in the post uh, are also listed here uh, to give a reference. And we've included also a bibliography with sources for um, vernacular architecture in Oman and some uh, specific reference to Harat al -Bilad. Then scrolling down, we reach um, the section of the website uh, that, is, that gives access um, to the exhibition. So by clicking on enter, <coughs> you land on the, on the terrace. Uh, so this is the first thing you'll see. And there is an interactive map um, giving you information about the five thematic, uh, thematic galleries. So you can see that there, are, there is this one, which is the lodger that you can see here, the rose, uh, the gallery for architecture. Then the two bedrooms uh, are instead um, dedicated to dwellings and details. And then there are the two sablas um, with photos and drawings on uh, townscape, and in this case, uh, on sabla. And then the central rooms uh, that instead of are dedicated to fortifications. Now there are three ways to navigate the model because this, this was also something we, something we were wondering. Because for me, it's very fun, let's say, to just navigate it by using uh, the arrows and uh, the mouse. So in this way, I'm just reaching um, the gallery here, the architecture gallery. Um, so you can then use the mouse to look around or move. Now each gallery has an uh, introductory panel and you can click on it to uh, read it better. And also you can do the same with the photographs and again, in this way you can access the captions mm -hmm. and also um, photo credits or drawing credits in, in the case of um, drawings done by Shaman. Then another way of navigating uh, would be 
from this point uh, to use this stuff, and basically from here you'll be directed, for example, if we click on post integration, at the entrance of the room where there are informations about fortification. So here again, you get the panel uh, giving generic information about fortifications within the settlements, and then um, all the photographs. So then another way again would be to activate the guide here. So uh, if we go to this gallery, you'll see that there are these dots here. So you can click on those and then just move at least through the corridor, but then when you reach the gallery, you actually move just to use the arrows and your either touchpad or mouse uh, to look around. Another way from the introduction instead, so from the landing point, uh, would be to use the interactive map. So if you click on one of those again, you'll be directed uh, at the entrance of each gallery. From here, you can go back to the home page, hopefully, yes. And at uh, the bottom, if you'd like, uh, once you know um, the virtual museum, and if you'd like to just see one of the galleries, you can also uh, click directly to one of these images and you'll be directed to the specific gallery. So I hope you can play with that later on. Um, now at the moment there are these three sections. Our aim would be to have a fourth section, which should host um, a sort of cultural, um, material culture uh, exhibition, because we are planning to go to Oman in, in two weeks, and Shannon in one week, and Jimin and I will join him in uh, two weeks, to um, document, photographically document, some of the, uh, of the artifacts, so that we can create a sort of 3D gallery and add it um, possibly at the bottom, or we will need to restructure it, but anyway, to give also some information not only about uh, the buildings and the architecture, but also the cultural material. So let's like, finger cross for, for these <laughs> steps as well. Um, so at the first exhibit, I think we are here. Can I try? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have time and you uh, that will to play a bit with it, or uh, based on what you heard, uh, we would be grateful if you can leave uh, feedback on uh, what, uh, what we said and, and on the virtual exhibitions so also how to improve it. So even if you don't try it now and you will try it later, please give us your feedback. Because we, we've been working on it for quite a long time now and certain things are just obvious for us. Uh, so we really need to get some feedback and, and trying to understand what like other uh, people think to improve it as much as possible. Because I, I think it could really uh, be a useful tool in, for, for many users. Uh, but of course, uh, the, you know, the, the more opinion, the better to, to improve it, and it will be more useful in this way. Thank you very much. Uh, for this. The, the population um, left this particular settlement in the late 70s, early 80s, and, but they are dispersed around the settlement. Um, uh, new uh, town plants have been created, established for uh, these inhabitants, and I think uh, some of those are problematically <laughs> created uh, within the Wadi areas, so they had to then create dams to divert <laughs> the water around these places. Uh, but there are 
the Ministry of Housing had actually developed uh, a range of plots uh, around this area. Now, much of that is also um, eating into some of the agricultural land, which is uh, there. Uh, the other thing that has happened is that those You'd, I'm sure, know that uh, you know during the summer many of the Omanis would have uh, lived in this sort of, if you like, a second home, which is within the agricultural land, you know, within a sort of reed huts and you know some mud buildings as well. But those have now been uh, transformed into permanent residences. So that is also eating into the agricultural land. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about villages, villages in Oman. Uh, villages uh, are very unique to Oman, especially the active ones it's in, or in Iran and Oman or, as well. You notice in Saudi Arabia and UAE, all the Saudi countries, they're not active anymore. Uh, and Oman is active. But at the same time, you notice that like, uh, wind cultures are very, uh, they're very popular in the surrounding areas in Saudi Arabia and UAE and Qatar also. But it's not, they're not uh, very popular in Oman. Is there a, I think there's a link, because I think sometimes it's village, uh, you know, it uh, kind of makes the weather a little bit more terribly com comfortable, uh, maybe. Uh, especially near to, near to some of the villages, they run through the settlements, or sometimes run through the mosques. Yes. I'm not sure if there's a link between the two. Mm. No, certainly it does, wherever it runs through settlements, it does actually change the micro-environment, without a doubt. Uh, it does. Um, However, I think maybe one of the things, one is that a big difference being that where the wind catchers are, uh, many of these are on the, along the coast where it can catch the breeze. Whereas in central Oman, the way those houses operate, which I was showing you the ground from the floor, that it operates with a particular timing of you know, daily activities. I think there is a specialist here, Sultan is here, who has written about those things a lot. But uh, if you look into, the, say, the temperature humidity, you know, that some of those upper levels you know, would be humid and at a lower temperature, say, um, comfortable temperature of, you know, in Oman, it would be, say, 28, 29, 30, 33, up to 33, it's a comfortable temperature, okay? And the humidity would be reasonably high at that time and during the day. Say after 10 o'clock, it begins to fall dramatically and the temperature rises. So at that point, what happens is that, you know, the, normally the daily chores of cooking and so on are actually uh, correlated with the change in the ambient temperature and the humidity. And so therefore what you see is that there are particular points by which the cooking is done. So after that, they will have their also coffee sessions downstairs in the lower room. So on the ground floor, there is a room which is mainly for the women, and that's where the, the daily coffee rituals in the morning or in the afternoon will take place. And that's because, not only just because that's close to the street, but it's also because that's the coolest room at that time, you know, when the temperature rises. So, and then again in the evening, as the temperature cools down, all the daily activities, hence the kitchen is upstairs, you know, and then the evening cooking, and, you know, the you know, if you, what you like, the Jalous, you know, the, the kind of the congregation of the family can take place on the upper level terrace. Now, that's a unique character of the Omani, central Omani dwellings, where, which, which is different from the coastal dwellings. You know, where the coastal dwellings work around the courtyard, you know, on the ground floor, whereas my view is that the courtyard is almost disaggregated into these different space, air, spatial, you know, uh, entities like one on the ground floor, which is the women's majlis, then one on the terrace, which is a kind of the full family to meet up. Also out on the street, where in the evening, you know, the families, but also immediate uh, male members can also join in. So this kind of operation, which allows uh, the temperature and the humidity changes to be taken into account, makes those buildings the way that they are. And of course, where there is a foliage, uh, certainly it helps in you know enhancing the humidity and uh, also creating an environment which is more livable. Okay. Thank you. We'll take one final question from the gentleman here, please. So, Miss Fitzalabriene, um, a simple question: When was the 
World Tourism Organisation Award given. But then if I can just give the context, I, I stayed there in February um, courtesy of a, a, a grant from the anglo Armani Society where we were linked with uh, linking the South Downs National Park with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Planning to promote the concept of uh, national parks in Oman where, where you can protect the environment and landscape mm -hmm. with settlements mm -hmm. within that. Mm -hmm. um, so we stayed in Mr. Tavabriin. Uh, Covid was still around but visitors were coming back. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered if as well as what the date was, have you heard how tourism is recovering following your recommendations and all the effort you put into Ms. Fetalabri? Uh, I think, uh, no, to be absolutely honest, we do not have the, the post-COVID information, but this award was given in 20, end of, the results came out in uh, November 2021. So, however, there are many issues which I do not want to talk in detail mm -hmm. with, I think have um, could be dealt with in a better way. Um, I think also the way one of the things that we suggested is that it's not enough to create a physical fabric. It's, it's also about capacity building. It's about training. It's about making sure that you know some of the qualities are understood before I think any further intervention is done. And I think some of those things are still uh, waiting to happen. So, and also that in the, which, you know, the, when we, because we had to write on behalf of the government for this United Nations, uh, the entry, and I think we drew mainly from what we had done in our master plan and our tourism suggestions and so on. Um, there are a number of steps that the government needs to take kind of pretty quickly, without which I think many of these claims will remain you know, futile claims and it will not be um, materializing. So um, there are issues, but I think on the other hand, I think this, to us, I think it's, it's worth talking about this more openly to understand what could be gained out of these approaches and where things have gone wrong. Quickly, go on. Does yes. the fabric still run in this uh, Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And there are, um, they, they still have the traditional management system in operation, although they have moved away from the, uh, the time measurement system, which used to be a combination of the solar uh, sundial and uh, also what they call the tassi, the, 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 you know, the, the a bowl with a hole in the middle, with, you know, put in another larger bowl. And you know, it depends on how long it takes to for it to drop down. You know, and be entirely submerged. That's gone now. It's wa uh, watch based, but on the other hand, yes, the system still works. Well, thank you so much to all of you. Our speakers will be around for a few more minutes if you want to follow up with them. I think you have really brought this heritage to life, <laughs> genuinely, and it really makes me think of what you said early on about the need to make heritage accessible so that ultimately it does survive. Mm -hmm. And this is really what you're doing. It's incredibly valuable. So let's give a final round of applause to all of our speakers. Thank you everyone for your valuable time.